Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Barbara Scafidio, editor of Preview, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. I am thrilled to welcome Don Penfold, a powerhouse in meeting planning recruitment um, and a, a longtime friend of the magazine. Thank you for being here. I'm going to do a quick thank you to our sponsors today, Explore Asheville Convention and Visitors Bureau, Kiowa Island Golf Resort, Lansdowne Resort, Naples Marco Island Con uh, Everglades Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Visit San Jose. Today's session will be recorded, so you will receive a, a link via email afterwards. Don't worry if you miss something along the way. As with all of our webinars at Preview, you'll receive CEUs from the Events Industry Council for your participation. So let's get it rolling, Don. Welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself for the two people in the audience who might not know who you are? <laughs> oh, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I started my career as a meeting planner um, 100 years ago, and I was a, both an association and corporate meeting planner and then started the company Meeting Jobs, uh, and which is an executive search firm that specializes in the meetings industry, as well as we do resume review and we have a job board at meetingjobs.com. And then a few years ago, um, we were purchased and joined forces with Cadre. And Cadre is, specializes in independent contractors and uh, independence work. So if you're looking for a contractor to go on site or long-term project managers, that's where you go at Hire Cadre. And uh, it basically brought it all together. and. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, who I am. And much more. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I've got everybody talking about where they're from all over the country. Um, Milwaukee, Toronto, Philadelphia, New York, my favorite place, Georgia, pretty much everywhere. East and and I'm also seeing some familiar names, which is nice to see. Nice to see. Um, I, we'd like to get a, a temperature of the audience. So if you wouldn't mind, we've got Jennifer behind the uh, screen. If you could roll poll number one, please. If you could answer everyone, how many years of meeting industry experience do you have? And then we will get you that answer so we know who's here. Okay, uh, the largest number of people, um, the largest group is 21 to, to 30 years. Um, oh. We've got 11% at zero to five. About a quarter of the audience has less than 10 years. Okay, and uh, poll two, please. What is you, uh, your demographic group? Not to put everyone in buckets, but we're just trying to understand so we can tailor this to you. This will be see. It'll be interesting to see if it matches the number of years experience. Right. Right. Okay. So hey. no one from the silence. The largest majority is the Gen X, um, and and again, there are the experienced. Yeah. But we've got 25% yeah. who, are, who are on the younger side, if you will. And we have one more question for you. Are you looking to hire or looking for a new opportunity or are you just here today um, to be Damn. here? <laughs> okay. So a lot of people on the call today are either looking or considering new opportunities. And it looks like we don't have anyone who's on the hiring side, which is okay. interesting. Okay. So let's get it rolling. With that in mind, it's um, our first question is just perfect. Um, it's got to do with the, the trends in hiring right now, um, post pandemic, more candidates want to work at home. I'd like to discuss the pros and cons from both perspectives, if you will. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because we were an industry that 
all of the other industries were starting to have the trend of working from home situations. And our industry was like the dog being drug, dragged through the mud that, you know, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go there. And um, all of a sudden COVID hit, everything went kaboom. And we all know what happened. And many of us lost jobs. Many of us um, went to an online format. And um, then all of a sudden, many people realized, gee, you can be a meeting or an event professional and work from home. You don't have to be in that office down the hall. And so what's happened now that I'm seeing is that many of the hiring officials are saying, okay, let's get back to normal. I want people to come back into the office where the candidates are saying, no, I, I really like working from home. I like that flexibility. And so that I have found has been very interesting. You know, um, and I'm, I'm going to rattle on a little bit about but what hiring officials are saying. We, you know, are being considerate by saying we want somebody hybrid. And there's a difference between hybrid and virtual. Virtual means you can be anywhere in the world and apply for the job. Hybrid means they want somebody local, but they're willing to let them work home two or three days a week. They want somebody who can come in at a minute's notice. And mm -hmm. it's interesting. And I'd like to ask, have people comment on that of why they think that hiring officials would want people in the office, you know, so but just put on chat, you know, what you think, why it's important that people would be in the office in our industry. Um, I'll tell you, <laughs> because I've been monitoring the chat, we've only got one person so far oh, who's okay. in the office. We've got a vast majority of remote, which is, is interesting. Um, so it it does seem that our industry, there's been a shift because pre-COVID, it just, it was, you, I wouldn't have said that. You wouldn't have considered it. Now, there, and there's pros and cons. I've, I've said to hiring officials to say, I want somebody in the office. I'll say, consider this. You're looking, and I'm just going to set an example. You're uh, an association and you're looking for somebody who's an association um, meeting planner with a specific skill set. It might be a specific industry or something. If you set your parameters to that local area, you're limiting who you can hire, where if you open it up, you can find that ideal candidate who meets your exact criteria, sometimes even at a less a lesser price and salary, because you're if you're in New York or New Jersey or Washington hiring from the Midwest, you may be able to hire somebody at a lesser salary. So you're going to find that ideal candidate at a lesser salary. Um, on the other hand, what you lose, and some of you won't be able to relate to that, is what I call the water cooler effect. Right. And the water cooler effect is brainstorming, being able to walk into somebody's office and say, you know, I'm considering doing this. What do you think? You know, or standing around the water cooler or the coffee, you know, coffee stand and saying, you know, um, I'm creating a new theme idea. What would be your input? Or I'm having challenges with this person. What do you think? Because when we are working remote, we're working in a Zoom environment or a an environment, a virtual environment like this. I don't want to promote to Zoom, but you're working in a virtual environment. So it's not like you you say, oh, let's brainstorm for the last for the next couple of hours. So you lose that water cooler effect. The other thing I'm hearing from hiring officials of why they really would rather have somebody in the office is they learn to find, do they learn the idiosyncrasies of that organization? What are the nuances? What are the idiosyncrasies? If you're around those employees all the time, you'll find out, you know, what XYZ person's preferences are and what kind of personality they have, where if you're limited to just Zoom calls or, uh, you know, virtual calls, you may not pick up on that, on that nuance. Let um, me ask the, um, didn't mean to interrupt, but let me ask all those people on the call who are either looking actively or considering it, if it's a deal breaker, give me a yes or no. And I'm, I'd be curious to see, and, and please do use the chat. We've got a lot going on there already. And if you have questions, I'm going to be jotting them down um, and Don can get to them. Well, it's, a, it's a deal breaker for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You know, I had a, a, and it's interesting to see which generation it's from. And we talked a little, we did do a survey with the generations. And, and this is one thing I want um, 
candidates and hiring officials to be more cognitive of is we are in the first time, probably in colliding generations in the workplace. We have maybe four, sometimes five generations working together. We all have different personalities. If you're talking to a baby boomer, I bet the majority of those responses that said it is not a deal breaker would probably be baby boomer generations. But if you're dealing with generation X, Y, Z, you're dealing with people who say, no, I need that flexibility in the office because that's what they're used to and that's what they want. And in that generation, they're more of quality of life generation. Um, so one thing to keep in mind when you're looking for a job or when you're hiring is to understand the demographics of that person and where they come from. And you'll be better off when it comes to interviewing and when it comes to hiring. I, I have to say um, another thing that's been brought up in a few of these comments is the cost. You know, gas prices have gone very high. You've got to include, you know, go to back, go back to having clothing, lunch, uh, a couple of people. Yeah. Too. And there's, you're right, there's the cost involved, I mean, of commuting into the office, there's the cost involved of, you're right, lunch, of clothing and everything like that. On the other hand, I'm finding that hiring officials feel they should pay less if somebody's working from home. Interesting. Is it fair? I'm, I, I, and I'm just, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that I've, when I've heard from hiring officials to say, well, they're working from home. So they should, they don't have those costs. So we shouldn't have to pay for that. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. And one person said it, it's 10 to 12,000 just to commute. Right yeah, off. and it, it depends on where you live, but yeah, 10 to 12,000 is important. You know, that's a big amount. Um, the other thing is socialization. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I come, I've been in this industry for, I, I, wow, almost 40 years. Okay. So, and socialization is very key in our industry of getting to know other people, creating ideas, you know, what do you do? What do you do? The whole thing. And you lose that socialization with people in your industry if you're not in the office, if you're not able to jump to an MPI meeting or a PCMA meeting, if you're working from home, you get a little bit more isolated. And some people like that. They like that isolation because they get more work done. Yeah. The, you know, I will speak just, um, I've been uh, remote since, uh, well, 28 years. <laughs> and I will say that my workday starts when I get up. And the company's getting that commuting time every single day at the front end and the back end. I do yeah. it very long day. And, and if I stop, you know, um, the trick is some people can't stop when they work at home. They do go back to it after dinner. There is work is always there. That's all. We could do an entire um, session on that. But what I, what I wanted to lead to is the next question. It's the perfect segue. And it has to do with work-life balance, um, which I've found it. It, it, I've had an, an enormous opportunity, thanks to my employer, to have more of that, I believe, because I'm working at home. But you told me the story of um, younger employees coming in yep. and using that term in interviews, and it wasn't accepted very well. Yeah, it's for that. The generations coming in want a work life balance. And again, that's where we get into demographics. Um, baby boomers didn't understand work-life balance. Um, it just wasn't in there. It wasn't part of the vocabulary, but the generations coming in want work-life balance and they should get work-life balance. However, what I'm finding in my last three placements, and I'm gonna talk about my last three placements, um, the candidates that went into the interview, talking to the hiring official during the interview and saying, I will do whatever it takes to get the job done. I understand that these events are very difficult and I know there'll be weekends. I know there'll be evening work. I know that, you know, this is what's gonna be required. I will do that. They got hired. I had candidates who went into the same hiring official or talked to me and we're talking about work-life balance of, well, no, I can't work a weekend or no, I don't wanna come into the office if, you know, five days a week or, 
I'll work hybrid three days a week, but no, the other two days are out. And that was just commuting in from, you know, Jersey City to New York. Um, you know, I've had people, they did not get considered by this job because even though hiring officials want to be good to their employees, their number one, their number one goal is to get the job done and to be successful. Um, so what I recommend to students or students, I'm sorry, what I recommend to candidates is first sell yourself, first show what you can do for them, and then start negotiating work-life balance. Then start saying, you know, okay, you can see what I can do and I can prove to you I can do this, but I'm only going to be able to work from in the office two days a week. So your job is to put is to put is to solve their problem and their problem is they want to hire somebody to do the job. So that's just my little soapbox no, no, I, about I, that. I, I found that pretty fascinating. Let's talk about soft benefits. Um, you, as you put it, our industry is a little bit behind. I started talking about things like um, my company just started unlimited time off. I thought that was pretty progressive. Um, there are all kinds of um, unusual requests you've seen. Um, and you had a great story about student loan payments. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're across the board. Unlimited time off can't be confused with unlimited time off. <laughs> um, unlimited time off doesn't mean you can take a vacation whenever, wherever, and how long you want to. And what I have found with people who have now with the policies of unlimited time off, they're taking their computers with them to work to on vacation. They're taking their cell phones with them on vacation. So there's it's almost like an entrepreneurial environment. It, when you know I've owned my own company since 1990, I have never taken a vacation without my computer and my cell phone. Right. You know. So that's that is where unlimited time off can hurt you because. Right. You know, you have to make it real clear what that means. Uh, okay, if um, I could read this from Jackie, I love this. Unlimited time off equals um, basically you having to say no to having time off. <laughs> it's just. It's, yeah. yeah. But what I'm hoping to see, and I've seen it with a few companies who want to project themselves as companies that want to recruit Generation XYZ. Um, they're offering more benefits that relate to that to that age group. And I don't want to get into ageism, but just to that age group. Um, so like one company, um, the candidate was not interested in health care because she was still under 27, could be on her parents' health care program. The company instead took that amount of money and offered it to her to pay off her student loans. So what they did was they found out what her needs were and that they effectively recruited her into the position. So mm -hmm. again, this is where our industry is a little bit behind because it's very hard to break corporate policy. It's very hard to break association policy. But if you're a smaller company with the flexibility to do that, you'll find that candidates, money is not always the only issue. It benefits. Um, I I've had candidates ask for crazy things. I had one candidate ask for pet care. So okay. when they went on, they wanted pet daycare. They wanted, um, when they went on the road, they wanted the association to pick up the cost for putting their pets into, um, into pet kennels or to have somebody come and watch their pets. Right. I've had people candidates are away. Ask, what? People are away quite a bit in this industry. Yeah, I've had, I've had people ask for parking. I've had people ask for, um, you know, in the hotel industry, it was very standard to have dry cleaning. That's not standard anymore. I've had people ask for if they're working in the office, well, you're going to expect me to, you know, you're expecting me to dress professionally now. I want a clothing allowance. Wow. You know, so there are some crazy things, but I think if you're small enough, and this is for people who are hiring, if you're small enough, try to be flexible with those, with those, um, with those benefits that you can offer, you know, the prospective candidate, find out what makes them tick and what will be, what will be happy for them. Um, if you're a candidate, be reasonable. Realize that if you have two years experience, 
or you're a rookie coming into the industry, you don't have as much clout to say, I would like parking in New York. I would like, um, I would like, you know, um, I would like you to pay for my lunch every day. You know, it all depends on what the company can offer and what they have, but just don't make demands that are just unreasonable. Right, right. Or you're not going to get the job. <laughs> let's let's move into interviewing. Um, we were talking uh, the other day about how most of that is done by Zoom now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you got uh, about a million tips, but can you share a bit of advice about oh, that? Oh, God, yes. Because I, I do all mine by Zoom first when I pre-qualify candidates and I'll, I'll do Zoom interviews and I'll say probably about, I would say probably about 95, 90 to 95% of all hiring officials will first conduct online interviews before they see the person uh, in person. And many people will never see the person in person. Um, you know, at all. Uh, so it's it's amazing. So, I mean, there are such basics. I mean, put yourself in the hiring official's position. What do you, what would you want to see if you were hiring somebody? Make sure your background is good. Make sure that it's not going to be interrupted. You know, uh, we talked about this before we went online. I'm concerned that my dog's going to bark because the UPS truck will come. If you're in a job interview, make sure that you make your environment as safe as possible for that interview. Um, dress professionally. This is not the time to show off your, your independence and your, your independent nature with your jammies. Um, this is, um, I have seen interviews um, where people have just worn very unprofessional outfits. And I don't care what you're applying for. I still am old guard that you should dress professionally for an interview. You're presenting yourself. Um, Try to make eye contact with the little green dot on your computer. So mm. it looks like that you're talking to the person. Um, smile, smile all the time because it projects it projects out with your personality. It shows what you're, what you're doing. Um, also, in, when you used to interview in person, you could also try to create relatedness because if you saw a picture on a, a credenza, or if you saw a painting, you could start a conversation with somebody and try to create that relationship. It's hard to do that on Zoom. So what I suggest is before your interview, do some research on that person, find out a little bit more about them so that you can get into and engage a conversation with that person, you know, and get to know them and they get to know you personally. So try to do that, but don't stalk, don't stalk, you know, you know, mm -hmm. um, so, and then also just try to create a professional, just a professional environment. Realize if you were in a live interview, you wouldn't be sitting there fixing your hair like this. And all of a sudden you're, because you wouldn't be seeing yourself, but now you're on a Zoom camera, you're seeing yourself. So during the interview, don't start going, oh my God, my hair, what a bad hair day. You know, don't, you know, don't do that. Don't, that think of yourself as okay. looking at the person and interviewing as if it was a live interview and make connection with that person also mm -hmm. minor things uh -huh. be careful of your clothing um for some reason there i saw a stat the other day and they said if you wear bright bold colors during an interview those candidates have not gotten the job as much as people who are more conservative, navy blue type, navy blue, black, and patterns, you know, very subdued patterns. So I don't know why, I don't know the reasoning, but, you know, do some research on what you should wear, how you should present yourself. And backgrounds. And backgrounds. Yeah. You know, backgrounds, especially. I have seen during interviews, dirty laundry. I have seen things that you should just not be showing during an interview. Pretend you're in somebody's office. Absolutely. Um, you, you did have a very um, interesting creative example of researching someone. And it was a, an employee who, uh, not employee, a, a job seeker who found out about the coffee habits of the person. Oh yeah, I mean, I, this is a great idea. I mean, then this, you know, we were going to, we'll talk about networking a little bit, but one of the things that what you want to do is 
I, I call it informational interviews. It's not an official interview with somebody. It's an informational interview. So I would call you, Barbara, and say, Barbara, you're an expert in the industry. And can I just pick your brain for five minutes to learn more about the industry? And if I impress Barbara, and then Barbara hears from Joe that he's hiring somebody, Barbara might refer that person over to Joe. And it's informational interviews. And we used to do it by calling somebody up and say, can spare 10 minutes with coffee? Let's go get a cup of coffee. Or, um, you know, let's go out to lunch. Well, I had a candidate and it's a great idea. What they did was they found out in conversation with, I don't know how they found out, but they found out that that person worked with pods instead of a drip coffee maker. So they sent them in the mail a pod and wrote a note and said, can we meet for coffee? I and love they it. got the information interview. So I love, be, I love that idea. Be creative. Find out what makes them tick. It might be sending somebody a, you know, a candy bar and saying, can you take a break? You know, and let's, you know, it just creative. find a way to get your 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 get into the door. Into, Absolutely. Into the and I I'm seeing the um the 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 responses from people, I think one of the greatest frustrations of job seekers is that you can't get even seen by HR. And I think this goes back to us, um, you know, doing so much of what we do through LinkedIn and um, so many, um, you know, how do you, how do you plug in the words that get you seen? So can well, we talk a little bit about yeah, LinkedIn? Well, let me just, can I just make a quick comment yeah. about HR? And I hope we don't have a lot of HR people online because I'm going to say something that might not be right. No, I don't um, try to circumvent HR. Try to get around HR. Most of the time, HR, they're not specialists in our industry. And so they get a job description from the hiring official who says, we're looking for this, 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 and this. And they really don't know the nitty gritty about what they do. What you want to do is get to the person who's the hiring official or somebody who knows the hiring official get into them and then ask them to get you into through HR. So circumvent it and make HR just the administrator instead of the screener. Okay. Okay. So, okay, back, I'm sorry, what was? Well, LinkedIn and getting oh. seen that way. Um, okay, LinkedIn wow. is the go-to place now for job search. And I wanna say meeting jobs is the go-to place for job search. It is a, it is a good place to go. But if you send your resume to somebody, the first thing they're going to do is go to your LinkedIn profile. They want to see what your profile looks like. So number one rule, make sure your resume matches your LinkedIn profile. Number two, make sure your LinkedIn profile is updated. Make sure your picture on your LinkedIn profile is professional, but shows some sort of personality. And I'm going to give you a prime example of what may not work. Um, a hiring official that I knew went to a candidate. And again, I think they're wrong and I thought it was crazy, but they went to their LinkedIn profile. The woman had a picture of her in her bridal gown. Mm. Okay. She must have been recently married. And the hiring official said, oh, she just got married. She's not, she's at the point in her life, she's not going to want to work hard. Her marriage is more important to her. And again, crazy thinking, but that's what their thought process was. Mm -hmm. And they never called her. So make sure your picture on your LinkedIn profile is professional, that yet shows some sort of personality. Right. Um, when you're applying for a LinkedIn job, I always advise people to be careful about what they apply for. It's so easy on LinkedIn if you apply for a job and then they'll come up with three other jobs. Here's three other jobs that match your job description. Would you like to apply to these? And if you click in yes, then it goes to the hiring official. And LinkedIn is doing this because the hiring official has to pay for everybody who pushes that button for that job. Then me as the hiring official will call the candidate and say, hey, I saw that you applied for the special events manager job in um, Chicago. And they go, really? Did I? I don't know anything about it. 
because it was just happened to be one of the three jobs listed. Do you want to apply for these? They never read the job description. They didn't know anything about it. So now you've got a hiring officials like, oh, great. I just paid for this. So be selective because when the hiring official calls you, you want to know about the job. You want to have a rough idea so that you can sound intelligent when they contact you. Interesting. Um, open to work. Do you, does it work on LinkedIn? Yeah, I, I always find it interesting if it's open to work. Make sure you don't put it down if you're still working. And, and candidates have done that. They put open to work and then all of a sudden they're, because remember, it's everybody is looking on LinkedIn. Right. Yeah. So that's, you can put open to work on there, but I would say use something more creative. Create your brand on that little thing. You can, you can, you can customize the ring. You can customize the ring, customize the ring. Like, um, uh, special events diva or whatever something that shows you who you are you know meeting you know meeting specialist Interesting. Um, i'm gonna ask the you, audience to put in the chat things they've done to be noticed on linkedin and let's see yeah what they, what I, i'd be interested to find out what people's reactions are the other thing is that what i found as a hiring official that's a little bit frustrating about looking on LinkedIn is that you can apply for a job and it'll show up in their feed that this person has applied for a job. You can also click on send message to hiring official. And then I'll get a message from the candidate saying, hi, my name is so-and-so. And it is a canned presentation that LinkedIn offers you. What you have to realize is that's canned. So that hiring official will get maybe 20 people with the exact same message. And I think they'll pick up that you did not write that yourself. Mm. So individualize that and always then attach a resume. Because if you just say, hi, I'm interested in this job, this is why, and you don't attach your resume, then they have to go back, search for you mm -hmm. and go back and forth. So make it easier for the hiring official. Also with LinkedIn on your resume, put the link directly to your site. You know, hyperlink your on your resume, your your LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. as well as your email address. But LinkedIn is the place to go. It really is. I, I a lot find of these people go. spend a lot of time on there. You know, we've yeah. got people who spend up to two hours. Um, someone... It's also a great place to network with people. You know, creating yourself as the expert. Um, yeah. If if I'm a hiring official and I will. Um, and I'm hiring for somebody in the pharmaceutical industry. And I see that so-and-so is started talking about professionalism, pharmaceutical meetings, you know, the Sunshine Act, trying to create themselves as the um, expert. Then I may call that person. I just saw a chat that somebody said, are there any reputable headhunters out there? <laughs> me, me. Got, right here. <laughs> yeah, here. Um, and I, I, I just want to, I want to go to that a minute. Remember, executive recruiters, we don't like being called headhunters. Executive recruiters job is to fill positions, not to find you a job. So it's great to be in their database and part of their network, but realize that their job is to find the candidate that meets the criteria of the hiring official. If any executive recruiter asks you to pay them money as a candidate, run that you should never be paying a headhunter or an executive recruiter okay very interesting yeah i mean people might not be aware yeah. and i think there's a difference between um headhunters or you know um recruiters for meeting planning and hospitality it's an entirely different you know it's a different it, it is a different um area yeah, hospitality will it will be more of the hotel industry, um, you know. I would say, and the suppliers to the industry. Right. right. So you can only go so far with LinkedIn and trying to connect with your connections, your connections, connections, and so forth. It's it's a it's a, a somewhat level of 
networking, but you know, real networking, we all know is where many people find it's jobs. and it's it's coming back. It really is. I mean, COVID really hit associations and professional association involvement hard because you couldn't go, you wouldn't go to network with somebody. Um, I still think one of your best ways of getting who you are across to somebody is by going to a meeting, is by meeting somebody in person, getting to know them. And I think that we're finding, um, we're finding more and more people, the associations like MPI and the local chapters and PCMA and, and ALIA and all those associations are starting to see more people come to their events. And it's not just going to the events and being a member, it's getting involved. And I mean, I, I've talked to hiring officials before and they said, and I'll present a candidate to them. They go, oh yeah, I was on a committee with them, with MPI. I remember they really did good work. And, or before they come to somebody like me, because they don't want to pay a fee, you know, for posting on the job board or for me doing recruitment for them, they would rather go to directly to the candidate and that's how they meet people. So I would say face-to-face -face networking is still very key. Another thing that is kind of a lost art, two lost arts, one is emailing. I highly suggest that you email people and ask questions and do informational interviews and get to know them, not just using text. Okay. Um, I, if you are interviewing with somebody, do not text them a thank you note. Email them, or this will blow people's minds. Send a note that you handwrite and put a stamp on it and put it in the mail. Those are the little boxes that are at the end of the street. And people will read, when you think of when you get mail, what do you open up first? You open up the handwritten thing that looks like an invitation. Well, that's another creative, I, I, now we call it creative. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 The old fashioned way. I, I really avoid, I mean, I get texts with people attaching resumes and it's just impossible. I mean, you're, you're on a phone and you're trying to look at somebody's resume and you, you know, you, then you have to print it out. If you're type that have to print it out and want to write notes on it. Again, I'm showing my baby boomerism, but think of who's hiring you and what their comfort level is with technology and what they want to do. So I still am one who says, first of all, write a thank you note, either by email or hand write a thank you note. And I, I even go to the point where saying, right after an interview, write an email saying, thank you for time. I am qualified because of this, 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 and then follow up a week later with a handwritten note. That makes Bring sense. yourself back so into their face. Speed is so important and people, you know, one person said the job will be full by the time they get the letter, you know, I've got about a million questions. <laughs> so do you just want to start on those? So what, what was that? I have a lot of questions. So why okay, don't we, we kind of like move over to those so we can get people some specific example that will help them in their searches. Um, the first one's more general, but I, considering the people on the call, I think we should ask it. Are you seeing people hiring, uh, companies hiring people who are 60 or older? Okay, there is, I am the first one who's going to say there is age discrimination in our industry. I really feel that way. And again, don't kill the messenger here. Um, there is age discrimination. Um, uh, but I want to rephrase that it, it may not be age discrimination as much as experience discrimination. And I'm finding that one reason they may want to not hire somebody over 60 is that their salary expectations may be higher. They have been there, done that, and don't want to pack a box, don't want to sort badges, don't want to um, do all the nitty gritty or not. Um, open to technology and new technology and new ideas. How do you combat that? What you combat that is during the interview, 
I always say, talk about it right away and say, or beforehand in a cover note, or when you're talking to somebody, tell them, I am strong in technology because of this, this, and this. I uh, get, everybody wants C-Vent training. Get C-Vent training. Show that mm. you've taken the initiative to do that. Um, ma make a sincere effort to say, I am not looking for a management position. I thrive on on-site work. I thrive on the operations aspect of it. You've just got to convince them of it. If a hiring official is prejudiced against a older candidate, you may not be able to change their mind. You may not be able to. So go on to the person who will be. And that's where networking comes in. That's where showing who you are comes in. But there is, there is definite age discrimination. So have as much as you can show your proficiency and yeah. your how current you and are. And take a serious, take a serious look at the fact of do you are you willing to do that work? Why, you know, find, you know, people are not hiring because they think I'm overqualified, I'm overexperienced, I'm asking for too much money. Realize you're gonna have to ask for less money because if they're looking for somebody with three years experience, they're gonna be making less money than somebody who has 20 years experience. Now, that's the other thing that we're running into a dilemma right now. I'm having hiring officials asking for people with three years experience. What happened three years ago? Nobody was hiring. So there is a there is nobody in our industry with three years minimum experience. There's people with four, five, six, seven, eight, and up years experience, or with one or two years experience, but that during COVID when there was no hiring. So realize what would a candidate, what, a, what would a meeting planner or a special event planner with three years experience being doing? And it's mostly operations. So convince the hiring official as a 60-year-old, I am willing to do operations. So you need to put it all out there. Yeah. Um, I had another person just said, um, um, Jack, um, I read to only include 20 years of experience on your resume or LinkedIn and leave the older jobs out. What do you think about that? Yeah. Is that you that first of all, getting seen. Yeah, I would. In fact, I would even not do 20 years. I would do 10 to 15 years experience. Uh, your last. Now, I wouldn't leave it off the resume completely or LinkedIn completely, but just list it as, you know, during these years, you, you know, uh, previous experience and what you did, you know, in just a one line item. But people want to know what you did recently. They want to know what your skill sets are recently. So that's, uh, that is very good advice. Okay, we have a, a, another person here who um, is more at the beginning um, level and wants to break into corporate. They focus on community nonprofit events and when they reach out, they just don't get responses from COVID, um, COVID <laughs> corporate versus the, the smaller nonprofits. How do you yeah. get well, it's hard to switch over. It really is. I mean, and it's not just it's not just nonprofit to corporate. It's or association to corporate or corporate to association. It is pharmaceutical to um, to financial or incentive to financial or incentive to pharmaceutical. Uh, we are very become very niche oriented. And the reason we've become very niche oriented is because we're hiring to have somebody do the job and they don't want to train. Mentoring and training is almost non-existent now. They want somebody to come in running. So what you need, and that's where I think the networking and the training comes in that if you join an association and get to know more about corporate meetings, you can tell the hiring official, I know my background's nonprofit, but I have taken courses in corporate meeting planning. I understand the nuances between not-for-profit and corporate meeting planning, and then talk about those differences because there are definite differences. You know, a corporate planner is a, a, a corporate planner is usually an expense area where a not-for-profit and association is a profit area. There's ah. a different, there's different budget lines. There's different ways of the different mentality. You've got to convince the person you understand that different mentality. The other thing is I would, I would find some corporate meeting planners 
and start doing informational interviews and say, I'd like, you know, I'm not look, you know, I know you don't have anything, but is there a chance that we can meet for 10 minutes or talk for 10 minutes where you can help me convince skill sets that I have that I can transfer over? And again, get your name out there, get known out there. But yeah, everybody's really tough about who they want to hire when it comes to niches. No, I mean, it's tough out there. And a lot of the, um, I think what I'd like to um, do, because I'm seeing a lot of people posting about um, getting passed up repeatedly, seeing a job reposted, um, job searches take time. First of all, what's a reasonable amount of time before you get frustrated like that? And when you do get frustrated like that, what can you do to get yourself out of it and keep going? Move on. Don't, you know, first of all, I am not, I'm finding that the right hiring official is hiring within two to three weeks. They're, if they find the pink candidate and, and that candidate will always ask me, well, when do they want to hire? And I always say when they find the right candidate, you know, it could be tomorrow. It could be a month from now. But it depends on your it depends on your skill sets and what you're applying for and what the hiring officials criteria is and how quickly they hire or not hire. So there's really no answer to that. Um, right. But for you, yeah. is it reasonable to say it's going to take you know as a a, a, a uh, employed meeting professional, it's going to take you six months to find your next gig? Or is there like a number? No, that- there's not. It depends on where you're applying, how you're applying, what your skill sets are. If you are, if you're somebody with two years experience applying for a directorship, if you are that person who's in the nonprofit industry applying for a corporate position, it could take you a year, it could take you 18 months, it could take you two years to find that corporate position. If you are a corporate planner applying for a corporate position, it could take you three days. So it, if you are a person who's bad at interviews, who just is really can't interview well, it could take you your whole career. If you're that person who's 60 years old, who's applying for a job with, they're looking for somebody who's entry level and you, don't, and you have 10, 20 years experience, it could take you longer. So it, I, I can't answer that. No, there's no formula, but yeah, um, stay stay positive and stay positive and move on realize that you've got to keep on moving on this is you're going to get 20 to 30 no's before you get that yes right you know you just have to realize that you've got to just move on to the next job don't put all your eggs in one basket but if you had like i talked to a candidate the other day and he said i've always wanted to work with xyz company I, it's like my dream. I've talked, you know, the whole thing. I want to work for that company. And I said, have you contacted them? No, I haven't. Well, why? If you've always wanted to work for XYZ company, why not contact them? Go to HR. Do you have any openings? Go to their website, find out what jobs they have, you know, try to network in that job. Right. Who do you know someone? Who do you know? I, I think we have time for a couple more questions. And I, oh, I just God, love how everybody's been sharing and I encourage you all to scroll back up and kind of read over the previous notes if you haven't been watching the chat. Uh, we've got a, a lot of people asking about part-time and contract positions, which is um, something you can surely speak to. What, where, what are some good sources for that? And, and oh, what's going on in I, that? I, you know, I have to lead you to our company, which is hirecadre.com. And th- this is where I always advise people if they want to have flexibility. Um, there are people who are full time independent contractors going from gig to gig to gig, and the gig economy is really strong right now. The other thing is that we have talked to hiring officials who are not hiring full time people, they're hiring project managers. And as one hiring put- person put it, he said, I had to lay off 20 people during COVID. We are such we are in such a roller coaster environment between illness, um, politics, environment, economy, that 
I'd rather hire project managers that I trust and get to know. And so that if we do have a downturn, I don't have to lay off employees. So th the independent contractor area we is very strong right now, very strong. And so what I urge people to do is consider of being a gig worker, you know, if you're not finding that job, because we're finding people from entry level all the way to, I need someone to work on food and beverage for a incentive conference for six months. Um, uh, company is Cadre, by the way. Yeah, so hirecadre.com is the website. Right, because you're in the game, you're at least, especially if you're not working, right? And, you know, and that. as I said, there are people who do this for a living. They just go from on-site gig to on-site gig to on-site gig, or they have the opportunity to apply to it and um, be a project manager for six months. And everything is done through the higher, the cadre platform. So your taxes, your workman's comp, everything is done through there. So that it's a really strong economy for that right now. And there is, you know, I live in Massachusetts. We have a very strong health connector um, insurance um, options, crazy amount of insurance options. So you can, uh, you can, you know, you can self-insure if you're not insured by someone else. Yes, yeah. so. it's, it really is. I, I find that people like the flexibility, but there are, I mean, we're, I, I swear there are people every day. I, I can't push as much being, um, having knowledge in technology, having knowledge in Cvent, having knowledge in um, Excel, knowing all those things. If you don't have that experience level, you're, especially for those who are 60 and up, you're, you're going to be left behind. And now we're getting into all the AI stuff and, oh my God. <laughs> uh, a session in itself. And maybe we will make that the next one. But do we have time for me to mention one thing about real quick about resumes? Yep. Um, I've had candidates ask, how do I, I apply for jobs and I never get, I never get noticed and make sure keywords are key. So look at the ad. And if the ad says, I'm looking for a meeting planner, or I'm looking for a conference planner, or I'm looking for a special events planner, you could do all those things. But if your resume says conference planner, and they're looking for a meeting planner, the applicant tracking system, the computer that looks at your resume won't pick you up. So change your resume using the keywords in the ad and so switch those over into your resume. Don't lie. I'm not encouraging anybody to lie. But what I'm encouraging you is to take the keywords. If they say they're looking for five years experience, make sure your cover note that you apply for the job says, I have five years experience because the applicant tracking system will pick that up. Your, per, your resume is not seen by a human being, at least for three screenings. So, yeah, and um, it's, I think it's, it's um, synchronicity that the last question I was going to ask you was about the applicant tracking system, because, which you just went and spoke about before I had a chance to ask you. Yeah, it is a black hole. A it really time. is. But it's, it's so key yeah. to use those same words, those same phrases and to transfer that over on your resume and then apply using that because this is a computer that picks up keywords and hiring officials will rank those words. So if it's important to them, the person have pharmaceutical experience, they'll say rank it on one to 10, they might rank it at 10. So if your resume doesn't have pharmaceutical at all in it, That's it won't just, be And does that apply to cover letters as well? Let's, let's end with that. They take an enormous amount of time to write. Um, you know, there's they all kinds shouldn't. of opportunity for typos. You try okay. original creative. First of all, writer, should people still be doing it? And does, are those words included in the, should they be included in the cover? Letter? Okay. So if you have an opportunity to write a cover note, do it. Wait. Sometimes okay. they don't give you the opportunity. Look at the number of words that you have to write your cover note. But when you write your cover note, talk to the job that's being offered to you. If you, it says looking for five years experience, pharmaceutical meetings, incentive experience preferred, must live in New Jersey. Your cover note should say, I have five years experience in the pharmaceutical industry. I have solid incentive experience, or I'm looking for CVEN, I have CVEN experience if that's in the thing. 
put that in your cover note because that will attract the attention of either the applicant tracking system or the hiring official or the human resources person. Do not put in that you're detail oriented, you like working with people, you like travel, and that you're open, you know, because everybody in an industry has that skill set. You want to set yourself apart from everybody else. So, you know, we're all detail oriented. And if you're going to put detail oriented, if I had a nickel for every time I saw that somebody misspelled detail and detail oriented, I'd be wealthy right now. <laughs> so make sure you check your resume for, for typos, for grammatical errors, for everything. I always say, have five people look at it and then tell you what you do for a living, what your skill sets are, and check for those things. Why don't we end with your um, website one more time, Dawn, and your company? Uh, mine is www.meetingjobs.com. And um, that's for permanent placement or hiring permanent people. And then our sister company is hirecadre.com. And that is for independent contractors or people looking for project work um, and on-site help. Terrific. So we do have a um, handout that is in your console with a lot of articles preview has done on everything from LinkedIn to um, networking and uh, hopefully will be of help to you. And Don will be following up with everyone uh, afterwards with an email and um, all her contact info one more time. And hopefully you can work together and get all these job seekers great opportunities in the future. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much it's for your time. It's been a pleasure, time. Barbara. Please have you have me come back. I'd love to help out. Love okay. That. All right. Thank okay. you, everyone. Enjoy the rest okay. of your day. Bye bye.